great. So um, a quick housekeeping note before we um, get started. This is the uh, webinar format of Zoom. So during the event, please type your questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom. And we're going to collect questions uh, for the panelists to address during the question and answer period after they've made their presentations. So once again, for those of you that have just joined, welcome to uh, the spring Weatherhead Forum. Uh, this is a special session of the Weatherhead Forum, uh, and it's designed to uh, uh, ordinarily we, we hold the forum to showcase the research and debates of the various units and affiliates of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard. Uh, but again, this is a special forum today, uh, and sometimes we hold these special sessions on big topics such as today's extremely timely session. Uh, which I'd like to note is being co-sponsored by the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies, uh, the series, uh, their series on critical issues confronting China. So our topic today, as you know, is China, the U.S., and the new global order or orders. Uh, and uh, I am Melanie Kamet. I'm the director of the Weatherhead Center. I'm also a professor in the government department at Harvard. It's really my great pleasure to introduce our panelists. I'm grateful that they could all be here. Um, I'll do some very brief introductions so we can launch right into it. Uh, everyone, by the way, is going to speak for about 10 minutes. And again, we'll open it up for Q&A after that. So our first speaker going in the order of the program is uh, Danny Roderick, who is the Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at the Harvard Kennedy School. His latest book is an edited volume entitled Combating Inequality, Rethinking Government's Role. Uh, our second speaker is Yeling Tan, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Oregon. And her latest book is Disaggregating China Inc. State Strategies in the Liberal Economic Order. And that was recently published last year in 2021. So congratulations. Um, Next, we have Stacy Goddard, who is the Mildred Lane Kemper Professor of Political Science in the Department of Political Science and Faculty Director of the Madeleine Corbell Albright Institute for Global Affairs, uh, right down the road here in the Boston area at Wellesley College. Um, she is the author of When Right Makes Right, uh, sorry, When Right Makes Might, <laughs> Rising Powers and the Challenge to World Order. Uh, then we have Jia Dao Zhang, who is a professor of international political economy in the School of International Studies at Peking University. His areas of expertise include the politics of energy, natural resources, and development aid. He's the co-editor of the Belt and Road Case Practice and Risk Prevention series. Uh, I also want to send a very special thanks to him for joining us because it is one o'clock in the morning for him. So he's really above and beyond in uh, joining our, our forum today. And last but not least is my colleague uh, in my department, uh, Alistair Ian Johnston, who is the Governor James Albert Noe and Linda Noe Lane Professor of China in World Affairs, again in the government department at Harvard. His most recent article of direct relevance to the topic at hand today is entitled China in a World of Orders, uh, Rethinking Compliance and Challenge in Beijing's International Relations, which appeared in International Security. Uh, so together, our speakers are going to address the topic of world order slash orders from a variety of directions. I very much look forward to the conversation, and I'm going to turn it over to Danny to kick us off. Thank you, thank you, Melanie, for um, organizing um, this uh, this event, and greetings to all my distinguished um, uh, panelists and and the audience. Um, I, I come to this topic um, uh, I'm twice disadvantaged, or to, uh, you know, twice um, uh, estranged, if you will. Uh, first, um, because I'm 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 an economist and not a political scientist, or International relations specialist, and um, and and much of the question, much of the discussion about power leaves me confused. Um, uh, the second is that I'm I'm neither, or the second source of estrangement is that I'm neither uh, Chinese uh, nor really quite fully American, um, and and so I come with a um, significant amount of of skepticism. Um, 
uh, with regard to claims of uh, beneficence on the part of major powers or, or, or um, a lot of worry about the exercise of power um, uh, by, uh, by major powers. Um, <clears throat> as I've been thinking about um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the shape that uh, the coming global order might take uh, in the context of increasing US-China uh, uh, competition, um, uh, let me start by by some uh, approaches and and, uh, and 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 concepts that I have not found helpful, or might lead us astray. Um, first, I would start with some some of the core tenets of liberal uh, internationalism, uh, the idea that uh, economic globalization and increasing economic interdependence um, would ultimately lead to more uh, global cooperation would transform China into a much more market-oriented or US or Western style economy, might even promote uh, democratization. Um, and that, that clearly um, has, 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 not, uh, has not played out um, and, and we need to look um, for uh, different sources of inspiration. Um, secondly, I would uh, caution against um, perhaps a kind of a pure realist approach uh, to international relations and um, uh, US-China relations. Um, the idea that national security uh, trumps uh, essentially all other goals, uh, including economic benefits, and together with other key features of the world, um, that is that the absence of a global enforcer and the, abs the presence of a lot of uncertainty um, necessarily would make conflict uh, as a dominant feature of the relationship between uh, great powers. I'll, I'll have more to say about why I think this is not um, a very helpful um, a way of thinking. Um, third, um, under sort of you know headings of things that I would stay away from is, is my great concern about this view of American exceptionalism um, that I think has both a liberal uh, version and a realist uh, version. Uh, the liberal version being that um, uh, US, because it's a uh, benign power, uh, makes good rules for the world, um, and that uh, US power, therefore, is, is um, inherently good. Um, the realist version, uh, essentially, which I see a lot of uh, in the Kennedy School, uh, is the argument that the United States need to remain a global hegemon uh, um, and therefore must not uh, allow China to become a major technological competitor um, because um, you know, a, a, a globally hegemonic United States is, is good for the world, that, that we don't, you know, US does not have bad intentions. Um, so I've been, uh, the question that I have is, is really about um, uh, thinking about these issues from different perspective, the question about a different path that we can take I would say that we must begin, uh, as we think about alternatives, we must begin by accepting that uh, China is going to retain uh, both a decidedly different uh, economic and political system, and also that uh, China will definitely um, have strategic interests of its own um, that the United States and the rest of the world will have to accommodate. Um, the question is whether this uh, entails uh, inevitable conflict uh, with, the, with the West, um, I'd like to argue um, that uh, perhaps not. Um, and I want to make uh, two uh, main points uh, in that direction. Uh, one that goes to the definition of uh, national interests and the other about the possibilities of a cooperative global order or structure. I think both points, um, point, both points take us away from the kind of determinism that some of these other perspectives bring to this question and uh, suggest a certain malleability and flexibility in terms of what is possible. So we have a lot of agency. First, with respect to national, inter uh, 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 national interests, uh, while um, states may prioritize national security and survival above, above all else, as realists uh, claim, I think there's a big gap between meeting that narrower objective and maximizing power. Um, the US, um, uh, is secure from an annihilation or invasion, uh, even without a military uh, presence um, uh, in, um, in the, around in the Asian continent. 
Um, there are other conceptions of national interest that uh, fall far short of an expansionist view of, of, of a US global power. The historian Stephen Wertheim, I think, has usefully argued that the expansionist vision of US foreign policy has always competed uh, with a more restrained approach, uh, which often in history has been misleadingly and dismissively uh, labeled as isolationism. Um, from China's perspective, I would say that China's territorial integrity um, also is likely to remain uncontested, even, even without the exercise of saber rattling or the projection of power vis-a-vis uh, -vis neighbors. I think beyond the baseline of national security that we ac accept that the minimal requirements of national security and survival um, uh, are in place, then the pursuit of power for its own sake is going to compete with other national goals, uh, such as domestic economic prosperity, uh, that, will, uh, that will or might require much less emphasis on, for, on geopolitical dominance on the world stage. And this opens up space for very different conceptions uh, of national interest. Uh, concreteness, for example, just imagine how different US foreign policy would be uh, if the dominant group shaping US foreign policy today was not the Washington uh, national uh, military, mil the military national security complex, but instead it, it was, let's say, purely business interest, interested in maximizing uh, 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 trade and investment, or alternatively mainstream workers uh, interested in economic security and high wages, uh, or for that matter, pacifists uh, interested in, in, in having a world free of, of, of war. Um, so there is a lot of space for thinking about sort of alternative conceptions of national interest that would move us beyond uh, simply maximization of power. Um, that's with respect to uh, definitions of national interest. With respect to the system as a whole, uh, I think it's true as realists like to point out that the world lacks an enforcer of rules. Um, there is no world government to ensure that states would act in accordance with rules. Uh, this does make cooperation uh, more difficult, uh, but does not rule it out. Uh, we have evidence from a wide range of domains, from game theory to real world experience, to lab experiments, social psychology, to, su to, su to, um, uh, to suggest that reciprocity induces cooperation. Um, a third party enforcer world government is not necessarily required to elicit cooperative behavior uh, in situations of repeated interactions. It is also true, again, as realists say, that uncertainty and the risk of mis misperceiving other states' intentions uh, complicate prospects for international cooperation among great powers. Uh, but this problem too can be mitigated uh, to some extent. Um, uh, in a, a recent essay, uh, my Kennedy School colleague, Steve Walt and I have argued uh, that what might work work here uh, in the context of this uncertainty and mutual distrust uh, is a kind of a meta regime or a framework that facilitates communication and enc encourages mutual justification of actions that could be possibly misinterpreted by the other side. The key here is to delineate areas where there are mutual gains and cooperation and those areas um, are clear to both sides from areas where such gains either do not exist um, or um, um, uh, uh, each, uh, each state, uh, for reasons of asymmetric information, uncertainty will want to act autonomously to protect its own interest. This kind of a meta regime would be agnostic about the specific rules to be applied in each issue area, uh, but it would essentially try to uh, uh, achieve two objectives. One is um, to enhance communication among the parties and to clarify the reasons for disagreement. And secondly, to incentivize the states to respond in what sort of international law lawyers call well, well calibrated fashion, that is to avoid inflicting unnecessary harm on others when they, they act independently uh, to protect their own interests. Um, and I think that kind of a framework might in fact over time build uh, more trust uh, and might enlarge the scope for, for cooperation. I think many people, realists in particular, are, are, are skeptical that creative institutional designs can make much of a difference. Uh, but I think the structure of, um, uh, of great power rivalry does not fully determine 
uh, outcomes or equilibrium in a complicated system where definitions of national interests, the strategies pursued, the information available to actors are all dependent on choices that the actors make uh, to some extent. Uh, and therefore, while this rivalry may not be conducive to a world of mutual love and harmony, it, doesn't, uh, um, uh, it does not necessitate a world of immutable conflict. Um, structure is not destiny. And I think we retain the agency to craft a, a much better, or for that matter, a much worse uh, world order. Uh, so let me just stop here. Great, thank you so much, Danny. And I think you do a great job moonlighting as a political scientist. <laughs> so uh, our next speaker is uh, Yelling Tan. Thanks very much, Melanie. Um, and thanks to the Weatherhead Center as well. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, and I have to say that as a former uh, graduate student associate of the Weatherhead Center and a former student of uh, Danny and Ian, it's um, really an extra pleasure for me to be taking part in this event. So let me just quickly share my slides. I just have one slide. Okay, so in my remarks today, I'm going to be focusing on the splintering or the fragmentation, as we might call it, of the global trading system into what we might call three different worlds of trade a world of open international rules, a world of sovereignty first, and a world of competing coalitions. And the characteristics that make up each of these worlds are fairly straightforward. In the world of open international rules, we have a situation where countries rely on a common set of principles to cooperate and to manage conflict. The World Trade Organization provides the main framework for multilateralism, and is additionally supported by complementary international frameworks. In stark contrast, in the sovereignty first world, uh, countries are unable to cooperate. Instead, punitive unilateral actions create barriers to trade. In many cases, these unilateral actions are driven by security and sovereignty concerns that may overshadow any uh, broader considerations of potential economic gains from exchange. And in the third world of competing coalitions, we have select groups of countries that are cooperating, but doing so segregated by um, competing spheres. And these different blocks uh, operate largely outside of the WTO. And so while we might have trade flows and economic cooperations moving fairly smoothly within a sphere, there is a lot more friction to economic exchange between the competing coalitions. I should note that I am drawing these different worlds, as I'm calling them, um, deliberately in rather stark terms to highlight differences. Uh, in reality, of course, there's going to be a lot more overlap in the various types of uh, trade actions and relations existing um, in the world today. So since 2016, um, a lot of developments have taken place in all three um, types of uh, trading worlds. Uh, now, without making an exhaustive listing of all of the action that has taken place, I thought I would highlight some key um, developments. So in the world of uh, open international rules, despite many of the problems that currently beset the WTO and the multilateral trading system, uh, efforts at rulemaking are still continuing. So there have been a number of joint statement initiatives, for example, on very specific issues, um, such as trade facilitation, ongoing ne negotiations on fisheries and subsidies, efforts to achieve agreement on major issues related to e-commerce. Other WTO developments um, include uh, negotiations on reducing domestic barriers to services trade, the launch of new, new initiatives related to trade and the environment and so on. And at the same time, uh, outside of the WTO, but complementary to uh, WTO rules, there are larger trade agreements that cross uh, different regions, uh, such as the EU and Mercosur uh, FTA, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership or CPTPP, and a fairly new digital economy partnership agreement. Uh, 
Across many of these initiatives, it should be noted, uh, progress is threatened by differences between the United States and China. This is the case, for example, in the fisheries and e-commerce uh, negotiations. And of course, China's application to join the CPTPP is going to be a very difficult and contentious issue. Additionally, China's application to join the Dig Digital Economy uh, Partnership Agreement also raises questions over whether or not its domestic data governance regime is compatible with that of other countries. Now, while that's been going on at the same time, a lot of action has been taking place in the world of sovereignty first. There's been, of course, this trade war between the US and China with both sides escalating their tariffs until the phase one agreement at the end of 2019. Alongside that, we've seen in the technology sphere, the imposition of export controls on Chinese companies, Huawei and ZTE, the placement of Huawei on the entity list, broader restrictions on the export of semiconductors to, to China. We've China's uh, response of creating its own unreliable entity list. Um, and although there are no companies on that list yet, there remains a threat that the Chinese government continues to be able to raise. Uh, China, of course, has also in recent years placed a number of export restrictions on individual uh, countries. Uh, notable examples such as uh, the restrictions on Australian exports of wine, beef, copper, and so on. <clears throat> More recently, Lithuania's establishment of a Taiwan representative office has triggered a ban on um, its exports into China, as well as restrictions on the exports of goods containing parts that may have been made in Lithuania. So to continue the, the, the examples, the US has stepped up its investment screenings, not just of inbound investments from Chinese companies, but also of American uh, outbound uh, investments into Chinese companies. More restrictions may yet be placed through the America Competes Act, uh, sometimes called the Anti-China Bill, where much of the legislation here reflects a sovereignty first logic in the sense that the draft legislation is framed around the idea that American competitiveness needs to be enhanced, not necessarily for its own sake, but in order to outcompete a rising China. And finally, in the world of competing coalitions, we see efforts to pull various countries into different spheres. So in response to fears, uh, uh, in response to fears of the geopolitical impact of China's Belt and Road Initiative, we see the Biden admi administration um, launching its own rather nascent uh, Build Back Better World Initiative, which also overlaps at the moment uh, with the rather vague Indo-Pacific economic framework, which while it doesn't necessarily have very strong trade content is nonetheless framed around the idea of building coalitions to counter challenges created by a rising China. This is on top of previous efforts by the Trump administration to exclude Chinese uh, telecommunications makers from 5G networks and on top of um, a clause in the renegotiation of NAFTA to potentially terminate the newly termed USMCA if a, if a partner signs an FTA with a non-market economy. And we also have the US-EU Trade and Technology Council, which while focused on quite a broad range of transatlantic issues, also includes on its agenda the desire to come up with co a common approach on contentious issues related to China. So as I mentioned, this is a non-exhaustive um, set of examples um, and it's by no means an accounting exercise. It's meant to be uh, illustrative, but I wanna close off by taking a step back to look at the drivers of this splintering, this movement away from cooperation that's been mostly centered on open international rules towards these two other worlds. And here I'd have to say in a sense, the world of sovereignty first and the world of competing coalitions really have more in common with each other than at first glance, in the sense that both are motivated by mercantilist approaches to trade. The notion that the economic expansion by one party necessarily will be at the expense of uh, the welfare of another. And both are also motivated by a broader securitization of approaches to economic exchange. And as a result, represent a real shift away from the post-war principles of embedded liberalism and the later move towards neoliberalism. 
And the problem with this splintering is that these dynamics are very much self-reinforcing in each world. And so the question is, and the challenge is, as Danny pointed out in his remarks earlier, is about how to create a different set of dynamics that might be self-reinforcing to build momentum towards broader cooperation rather than towards this broader splintering. Uh, with that, I uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yeling Tan, and um, and I'm going to turn to Stacy Goddard next. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie, and I want to thank the Weatherhead Center again to for this invitation. It really is an honor. Um, I am a political scientist who studies revisionism and historical orders. So much like uh, Danny Roderick, I, I want to start off by saying that I'm not a China, China specialist like many of my colleagues. So I always kind of put it out there that, you know, if what I say contradicts with what they say, they are absolutely right. Um, but I do want to talk a bit about revisionism and global order and particularly try to bring an historical perspective uh, to the questions we're talking about today. And what I really want to focus in on is the United States policy of institutional engagement that it developed in the 1990s as a way to preserve the liberal global order. And the reason I want to draw attention to this is really there's been kind of a, a flourishing of, of, of recent articles really critiquing this strategy um, and, and really pointing to the strategy of institutional engagement as the reason we're at this moment of revisionism that we see today. And by revisionism, I'm simply referring to attempts to challenge the status quo of the liberal global order. Um, I probably don't need to go into much detail about examples from, from Russia at the present moment, but one of the things I wanna point out is the way in which Putin, for example, has increasingly framed Russia's actions as resistance to and alternatives to the global order. And others point, for example, to the way China has acted in the South China Seas or its creation of different economic institutions, as my colleague Yang pointed out, as attempts, not not simply to form complementary institutions, but also to engage in a fragmentation of the global order. And as I mentioned, this is a moment that critics have really seized on this to critique US foreign policy, not just in the present, but in the past, and really using this as evidence that the United States should never have adopted a strategy of institutional engagement in the 1990s, a strategy of really bringing in potential revisionists into the global order in hopes that this would stymie revisionist efforts. As a matter of fact, in a recent foreign affairs piece, John Mearsheimer at the University of Chicago calls these actions the most consequential strategic blunder uh, that the United States has made pretty much in its history. So, so this is a pretty substantial claim. And what I want to do today is really just make three uh, points uh, using this historical record on revisionism and historical global orders. Um, first, I'm, I'm going to give a little ground to the critics. There is an extent to which they're correct. Uh, over history, looking at period from about 1815 on, it's really not been the case that institu institutional integration, bringing states into a global order has constrained revisionist behavior. So to that extent, they are correct. But what the critics miss, and this is my second point, is that while institutions may not stop revisionism in its tracks, they do channel revisionist strategies. And in particular, by incorporating potential revisionists into institutions, this can often make violent revisionist strategies less likely. And I wanna conclude on what this says about revisionism and contemporary orders. And what I wanna point out here is that Russia and China are actually very different revisionists because they're positioned in institutions in very different ways. And the good news here is that China actually has very little incentive to use force to try to challenge the institutional order. Um, less good news, at least if one is somebody in the United States and a proponent of, of, of a liberal international order, China is likely to be a very transformative force given its position within institutions. So let me just start with this first point. You know, if we bring it back to the, the dream of the 1990s, so to speak, and we have this moment of the United States being a dominant power, looking to expanding and deepen its existing liberal institutions across all realms, economic uh, security, as well as diplomatic. And part of this strategy was the idea of, of expanding membership to bring in potential revisionist states. And here again, I don't mean violent states, I'm just talking about states that might eventually be interested in challenging the international order because of their growing power. And the focus here was really both on, on China and Russia. And the idea here was bringing states into institutions, giving them membership, would provide a lot of different mechanisms to constrain revisionist behavior. 
And these range for anything from increasing the benefits of cooperation, it was better to be within institutions than working against them, to actually being able to punish revisionists if they did engage in, in revisionist behavior, um, as well as kind of broader effects with the idea that you could actually socialize states like China in, in, into becoming more cooperative states. And obviously kind of at, at the extreme here, was the idea that you could actually liberalize China or Russia and make them more liberal and democratic states and, and participants. Okay. Now, there certainly were uh, proponents of an institutional engagement strategy were extremely optimistic. Um, and I would argue, had they you know, looked more carefully at the historical record, that there would have been reasons to be skeptical about the effects of institutional integration. Um, in my research, where I've looked at cases of institutional integration from about 1815 on, um, I see a lot of cases where these institutions have failed to constrain revisionism. Um, so looking, for example, at the case of Russia in the early 19th century, very deeply embedded in concert institutions, but still seeing a strain of revisionist behavior that eventually leads to the Crimean War. Uh, likewise, in the mid to late 19th century, we see Prussia, very much a member of good standing and in, uh, in, in European institutions, eventually engaging in really transformative actions, kind of overturning the concert system and putting into its place a much more nationalism-based order. Um, and likewise, it's worth bearing in mind that Imperial Japan was deeply embedded institutions like the League of Nations, like the Washington system, before it actually engaged in its own revisionist behavior. Right. Now, all of this seems to be fodder for critics of institutional engagement to say institutional engagement doesn't work. Um, and it's certainly, I think, there's evidence to say it doesn't constrain revisionism outright, but it does shape revisionist behavior. And this brings me to my second point. And for that, I want to take a brief step back and, and really caution against thinking about all revisionism as adopting violent strategies. I think when, when people often say revisionism and global orders, they're thinking about those moments of hegemonic war, the type of Napoleonic expansion, for example, in, in, into Europe. But one thing that, that, that really comes up from the historical record is that there are a number of potential revisionist strategies to challenge the status quo. Um, and I've identified a few of these. One of these, for example, is called institutional engagement. And, and this is where powers actually use the resources within institutions in order to negotiate their way to transformations in the order. Some countries actually rely on strategies of exit. Rather than attempting to challenge the order from the inside, they kind of adopt a strategy of let's take our toys and, and go home or at least go elsewhere. And this is very much the strategy of the Soviet Union, for example, at the, be at the beginning of the Cold War. There's a third strategy, um, which in some ways I always find the most intriguing, which I call rule-based revolution. And much like institutional engagers, they attempt to pursue a transformation from the inside, but they also end up harnessing institutional uh, resources from the outside. As Ian has shown in his work, there are oftentimes multiple orders. And what we see are these types of revisionists drawing from these multiple orders in order to affect uh, this kind of really revolutionary change. Now, what explains this type of variation, this is really where institutional membership comes in. What's really interesting is that ironically, by bringing potential revisionists into institutions, this oftentimes gives them the type of resources that they can then use to be able to transform the order, right? So nations that join security institutions increase their ability to mobilize allies. Countries that join economic institutions have secured leverage over their trading partners. Nations that become members of political institutions gain legitimacy for their broader normative visions. So for, rather than constrain these types of revisionist efforts, incorporating states into global orders shifts their revisionist strategies. And as a matter of fact, one thing that I found is that when we think about violent revisionism, that's often the strategy of last resort. That's a type of strategy that happens when states don't have other institutions to draw from. So what does this mean for contemporary global orders and particularly our understanding revisionism within these orders? Well, as I've said, Russia and China are in very different positions and I'm happy to take up questions of Russia in the Q&A, but here I would actually say that what we're seeing is not a consequence of Russia having a, a good position in institutions, but again, kind of strategies of last resort. In the absence of, of real economic diplomatic leverage, we see Russia relying on really disruptive and limited violence in its own region. In terms of China, again, I think there's good news and bad news. The good news is there's really no need to use violence. China is very simply too institutionally powerful and influential to have to rely on this. But it is, I would argue, very much a transformative state, one that is positioned in a way to engage in rule-based revolution. And I think that we're going to see this, for example, and we can talk more about the, the kind of narrative, emerging narrative of a community of common uh, destiny and what that means for transformation in the global order. <laughs> 
But in general, I, I think what this means is we need to be thinking about global institutional orders and more specifically the liberal global order in a much different way than maybe the institutional engagers thought about in the 1990s. Rather than think about global order as a way to constrain revisionists, as a way to eliminate revisionists, we want to think about global orders as a way of managing power politics. We all understand that when power politics get out of hand, this is something that can have catastrophic effects, not only on the great powers, but everybody who happens to be in their orbit. So if we can begin to shift our idea to the ideas that these institutions are there to channel global power politics into forms that are likely to be more peaceful. That's where we begin to think about ordering, uh, reorienting our ordering projects. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Stacey. And uh, next I'm gonna to turn to Jia Daozhen. And good, good morning here from Beijing. And um, I thank the Weather Health Center for inviting me here. Uh, you will have to bear with me because I speak English as a second language and it's uh, uh, one o'clock here in the morning. Um, let me begin by saying, I thought there are three key words that are often used that probably brings those concept, concepts are confusing a lot of the discussions um, about China and US and global order, the three keywords. One is power transition. Um, this uh, term was, has been widely used going back 20 years, even before China joined the WTO or whatnot, or the 1990s. And I would think the tradition of doing political science, the rationality that's built into analysis that should we say subjective, that's, uh, a lot of times uh, leads us to uh, observers to cherry pick those things that fit into those kind of molding of thinking. That's not very helpful. Um, second general observation is that over the past 20 years or so, uh, one of the vocabularies that have been used and I would think abused is trust in say, okay, everything else being equal differences, civilization or whatnot, political systems, let's try to have some trust. What do you mean by trust? How do you define it, right? A lot of times we're not very careful. A third general observation is this idea of rules-based order. Here in Asia, people don't, not just Chinese, when you, you listen to the Southeast Asians, uh, in particular, um, they organize they the put together institutions like Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The ASEAN, in turn, organized these regional security forums. These forums are usually laughed at, the being talking shops. But no, they're not talking shops. They're extremely important pillar of building order. What's that order? That order is the fundamental principle is that no more Vietnam, meaning we are not going to have another war in the region that involves so-called great power rivalry. The, the Vietnam War and also the, by extension, the war that uh, <clears throat> involved Cambodia and Laos, it's just too painful. And it's all many di di dimensional uh, diplomacy and uh, engage everyone. So those are the three uh, general observations. Instead, we talk about rule, rules are important, but the rules face the community. So the community in, is, not based on uh, some kind of preconceived notion of what is morally superior, the right, the order, right? Right, what there is that dimension of the meaning there. It, uh, uh, again, it, it, it talks about um, taking in each other simply because the, the, we are in the neighborhood, we are in the community, it's a more geographical term and then let's try to find commonalities. Now let me move on to some topics about US-China relations. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I would think, or unfortunately today, in China, uh, in US American circles that study China, you still, it's not the whole idea of the geography of China is still not very settled. Very few people use the term China proper 
that goes back to colonial age. But when it comes to issues that come up, you know, drive everyday tension and uh, that lead to some observers say China is revisionist or challenging your order, it goes back like Taiwan. Earlier, there was a mention of Lithuania. For us here in Beijing or in China, Nixon came. And that's premised on two key points. Two key points. One is that the US accepted the Chinese political system. If you, you are not going to uh, reestablish uh, re diplomatic ties if you don't accept the system, right? And second, the US was going uh, uh, was going to uh, subscribe to the notion of a one China principle. Now, of course, over the years, there has been a convenience of selective vocabulary. American diplomats never talk about one China principle. They talk about the one China policy. One China policy is what Zhou Enlai explicitly rejected. That would imply a one China, one Taiwan, or one China, one ROC, one TRC. But in any case, we managed to survive. And there are there are those are serious issues, and those issues are not do not have to do with the political party or ideology that you can call it civilizational or a nationalistic, uh, uh, nation based. Should I put it that way? Now I, I know Yang is going to talk more about this. When you, you when you when people say that China has been trying to set up an alternative order. You try to take peak period off about the only thing I would think that can credibly amount to some sort of evidence is the creation of the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And now it's almost 10 years in the running and how the bank functions, people have a way of judging it. So. Uh, we, we, we can talk about, I can, I can answer questions about South China Sea later on in the discussion, uh, but let me move on to a, a third point I was going to prepare to say. Now, what is China about? If you know, we have reservations about the rule-based order, if we have fundamental challenges about, uh, uh, differences about the geographical scope of the country. Uh, what, what's China's national purpose? Here, as was alluded to earlier by Stacy or Professor Goddard, yes, there, is, there are problems in Chinese expressions, even with those recent Winter Olympics for shared future. That's wrong translation. China does not own the future. We have no right to share it with anyone. It's a common future. And uh, one of the recent phrases uh, that often get translated as common destiny. That's also a very bad translation. But exactly what is it? Of course, you know, how and why you have so many white people who speak English, who have, you know, such a depth of civilization, you cannot, uh, still after all these many years, you cannot put out a uh, proper translation. That's not my answer. But personally, I would think uh, a, in terms of national purpose, and, and another expression in English can probably stand the test of time. That's autonomy. In other words, uh, this goes back to the you know uh, the uh, late Qin Dynasty. It goes back to uh, Xin Yasan, and of, certainly after Xin Yasan, the Communist uh, Party. Uh, basically, the Chinese somehow have a that depths of self-confidence are saying, give us some space. We find a way of governing. We're not going to go uh, all the way uh, Western, nor are we, we do not, nor are we going to all, all the way Russian or Soviet. We reject this idea of any country being a locomotive, uh, you know, China being a train, a, a, a cart on the train, or China being a lo locomotive, or another country being on the train. Let me put it that, that way. But certainly, China, the, in terms of Chinese government policies or bureaucratic behaviors, there is a credibility problem. We're not; they are not very good at um, articulating this or making themselves convincing. Uh, certainly, I don't think I. I, uh, I hope, as a scholar, I made a bit of a contribution. I understand my time is quickly up. 
Uh, what about the uh, U.S. in Asia? The U.S. has played a very positively contributing role, especially uh, during uh, in the wake of World War II. And you know, although it's controversial and, and politically probably incorrect uh, for many Chinese, the public to acknowledge that. But the U.S. has played a very enabling role. But then the next question is, should the U.S. be dictating what the future is? It goes back to what I said about autonomy. You know, you, you, uh, that's probably where some of the friction is will have to be a little bit, uh, uh, will have to continue with some friction, but I don't see the uh, conflict as an inevitable at all. Now, let me make uh, three quick points about the everyday US-China relations, then I stop. It's a bit of a bewilderment to us why and how when you know the US resolved its trade dispute with Japan, you ended with inviting Japanese companies to the US to create job and wealth in the United States. But this time around, you rejected. Is there something deeper here? Because you are talking about middle class centered whatever economic policy. You would even, you know, Chinese or whoever that goes into the US that's subject to US laws and regulations. But instead, the America, America has been such a powerful and self confident country that in every way talking about rejecting Chinese influence. This is a bewilderment to us and probably a bit of revisionism we're thinking about the 1990s of the uh, US at, as well. And uh, secondly, uh, it's that uh, uh, the BRI, I, I think uh, the, the uh, contribution it makes is that it's very much like when Nixon came to China, we were talk, there were a lot of uh, promises. The, I, uh, the, in, in what I'm really trying to say, it's not an alternative order. It's an invitation, open invitation. It depends on the partners that uh, in one way or another, one shape or another, uh, we can discuss more later on. Uh, the last point is that uh, I, I'm a scholar, but I would think that for to further this sort of discussions would be useful to bear in mind what Mr. Xi said when he was a vice president on a trip to Mexico City, he said, well, today China is not exporting revolution, it's not exporting poverty. Why is it that China is viewed as a threat outside of the country, right? Uh, there are a lot of, uh, that question is not necessarily just for outsiders, that question should be uh, asked to uh, Chinese scholars as well as the diplomats, especially diplomats as well. Let me stop here, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. And not only is your English as a second language impeccable, it is impeccable at two o'clock in the morning. So quite impressive. Um, last but not least, I'm gonna to turn to Ian Johnston. Uh, thanks very much, Melanie. I'm just uh, sharing screen here. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much for the, the opportunity to, to chat and to give a, a presentation here. And, and I learned a lot from uh, some terrific insights from my, from my colleagues. And I think what I'm about to talk about it resonates, um, or you can find bits of resonance in, in each, of, uh, each of their talks. So what I wanna do is um, compare the officially articulated visions of world order in the United States and in China. Uh, the U.S. vision is usually referred to as the rules-based order, and the Chinese vision is usually referred to as the uh, community and common destiny. And I, I completely understand uh, Professor Jia's concern about the translation. I'm actually using a Xinhua news agency translation there, so I understand the problems with that, uh, with that translation. Anyway, what I want to do is hypothesize that these uh, narratives about order matter not because of their specific content, but because they embody claims about the exceptionalism or virtuousness of the in-group of self. And we know from very robust theories in social psychology and in social neuroscience that claims about exceptionalism of self and therefore claims about difference with other contributes to intergroup uh, conflict. 
So in terms of the uh, rules-based order uh, narrative, uh, as you know, that this narrative goes that the rules-based order was set up in 1945 uh, after the Second World War, comprised of liberal economic and political norms and institutions that have guaranteed peace and prosperity ever since. Now, there are a couple of problems with this particular narrative. Uh, one is that the rules-based order is actually a recent term. Uh, it entered the U.S. policy lexicon in, in 2010. It actually came from, cover, uh, from Kevin Rudd, the, the time the foreign minister of Australia, uh, in a meeting with uh, Secretary of State Clinton in 2010. Uh, she adopted that language, um, and it was initially, uh, in the early years, in 2010, 2011, an aspirational concept. Uh, people talked about a rules-based order that needed to be built in the Asia-Pacific. Around 2012, 2013, it morphs into this narrative about 1945, the RBO being set up in 1945 and focused on and, and having achieved peace and prosperity ever since. So that's one problem. But more fundamentally, uh, arguably, um, I think, there is no single uh, rules-based order. Uh, orders are not constructed uh, overnight by states. They are, in my view, the emergent properties from complex interaction of states, of international organizations, of multilateral, cor multinational corporations, non-governmental organizations, non-state actors, ideas entrepreneurs. And these emergent properties vary across fundamental, uh, across uh, uh, functional domains. Uh, they can embody sometimes contradictory norms and institutions. And I'll give uh, two extreme examples of, of different orders that exist simultaneously. The most important order, in my view, is what I would call the constitutive order. And these are the norms and institutions that constitute nation states as the primary actors in the system. So these are the norms and institutions uh, like sovereignty and territoriality. And, and these are embodied in uh, the United Nations, for instance. The PRC loves this order, the US loves this order, all states love this order because without this order, states wouldn't exist uh, as states. So to, to, to use one term out of uh, international relations, it provides in a sense ontological security, uh, th this particular order. At the other extreme, uh, arguably, is uh, what could be called perhaps the political development order um, that constrains how states treat political groups within their borders. And this order has uh, stressed individual uh, political rights and over time has included uh, uh, rights specific to certain social groups, to women, to children, to the disabled, uh, and to ethnic minorities. And increasingly over time, this order has justified humanitarian intervention into uh, sovereign states. The norms of this order are therefore in considerable tension with the constitutive order and uh, the constitutive order's stress on sovereignty and non-interference. The US generally supports this order, though much of the evolution of the uh, political development order has actually not come from uh, the US government itself. Uh, China opposes much of this order and has worked for decades to dilute or obstruct any features of this order that might threaten uh, the rule of the, the Communist Party. Now, the existence of multiple orders uh, with um, contradictory norms and practices suggests that the common binary that is used in policy discourse, as well as to some degree in international relations uh, 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 discourse of, of, of a status quo state versus a revisionist state is not a particularly useful concept at the systemic level. Who's a revisionist, who's a status quo uh, state uh, really only shows up at the level of these different orders. So a state may be more or less status quo in one order, uh, but revisionist in another. And the following couple of slides kind of embody, it seems to me, that, that this, uh, this, this complexity. Uh, people can see this, I hope. So if you imagine a world in which uh, the rising power is a purely revisionist state and the hegemonic state is a purely uh, status quo state, what you'd expect to see is uh, norms and institutions um, that the hegemon supports being opposed by uh, the rising power. And what you'd expect to see is any norms and institutions that the uh, rising power proposes or appears to be pushing forward uh, should be opposed by the uh, hegemon. So in a sense, you should see kind of distribution of norms and institutions across this, uh, this axis. Um, but what does reality look like? So what I did was I kind of just sat down and wrote down a bunch of norms and institutions that cut across economic order, finance, arms control, human rights, 
And you get a distribution of norms and institutions that does not look at all like uh, the, uh, the distribution one would expect if the world was comprised of status quo versus revisionist states. There's lots of norms and institutions that the United States and China both support. There's lots of norms and institutions that the United States and China both oppose. There are some institutions and norms that the United States uh, opposes that China supports and some norms and institutions that uh, US supports and China opposes. Uh, now, this is a very crude categorization. I'm not talking about the reasons why they support or oppose or the level, to, the degree to which they uh, support or oppose, but it does suggest <clears throat> that the distribution of um, norms and institutions uh, in the international system, uh, it's not obvious in a sense, looking at this distribution, uh, who's the status quo power and who is uh, the revisionist power. So these are some problems in the rules-based order uh, narrative. What about the uh, common uh, community common destiny uh, order concept that the PRC has uh, developed? So the PRC's concept of order was developed under, uh, under Xi Jinping, and it's largely aspirational. It describes what the order should look like, <clears throat> but it's, I would argue, is kind of conceptually incoherent or contradictory, or uh, it's kind of a kitchen sink collection of ideas that blends everything from kind of traditional Westphalian concepts such as the five principles of peaceful coexistence uh, with enhancing the role of the United Nations, um, with uh, references to traditional Confucian uh, platitudes, with liberal notions of economic interdependence, uh, with notions of kind of global ecological consciousness, with uh, standard real politic ideas about the defense of national interest. Despite the packaging, much of this is actually not new. The five principles of peaceful coexistence uh, go back to the early 1950s. And core elements of the uh, community common destiny idea reinforce China's longstanding support for sovereignty centric con constitutive order and reinforce China's longstanding opposition to the political development order and the potential challenge to the CCP's monopoly on rule. However, despite these differences in content, uh, the two visions of order may actually have a similar unintended effect, namely contributing to a notion of in-group exceptionalism that also uh, constitutes uh, out-group denigration. So there's a very powerful theory in, international, in the political psychology called social identity theory Basically, it tells us that um, those who most strongly believe in an in-group's virtuousness um, uh, are primed to denigrate out-groups uh, and to view uh, the out-group, therefore, as less virtuous as a potential threat and therefore requiring vigilance or coercion to deal with. This in-group exceptionalism is almost always related to an inability to empathize, uh, a tendency to simplify the motives of the other, and in worst cases, the dehumanization or partial dehumanization of outgroups. So where is the exceptionalism embedded in the rules-based order uh, narrative? The notion that there is a single US-led rules-based order constitutes the United States as the status quo state, and therefore, at the same time, it constitutes perceived challengers to this order, China, as, uh, as a wholly revisionist state. Status quo states are obviously virtuous, upholding norms and institutions that have kept the peace and prosperity according to the uh, uh, rules-based order narrative. Revisionist states therefore are by definition the opposite. So this sets up a binary that as I suggested, misses the complexity of multiple orders and the messy reality that states may want to revise one order while preserving another. But because of its inaccuracy and its rejection of this complex reality, the RBO contributes uh, to, or potentially contributes to security dilemma dynamics. Now, where is the exceptionalism embedded in the idea of, a comp, uh, of a, the CCD, of a community of common uh, destiny? I think it's in the theme that Chinese traditional ethno-cultural values uh, embedded in the CCD uh, reflect China's inherent peacefulness. And this is a, a, a narrative that is, is, is widely used um, by Chinese leaders. And Xi Jinping himself has even used a kind of genetic metaphor saying that the Chinese have no invasion DNA. That'd be like saying Americans have no racism DNA. It's wrong on so many levels. Um, 
But like the uh, rules-based order, this claim about inherent peacefulness of the Chinese people and culture is historically inaccurate. There's plenty of historical evidence, both pre and post 1949 of the use of violence and coercion to deal with external and internal threats. But the accuracy is not the point. The perceived in-group peacefulness is the basis of claims about exceptionalism. Now, surveys I've been involved in uh, in China, for example, over the years uh, show that the more respondents believe that the Chinese people are inherently peaceful, <clears throat> the more warlike they believe the outgroup, Japanese or Americans, to be. And consequently, they have actually stronger rail politic uh, attitudes for dealing with uh, the outside. The same kind of relationship exists between exceptionalism and rail politic uh, practice or rail politic preferences. Uh, th this also shows up in surveys in the United States. So this notion of exceptionalism embedded in the uh, the community of common destiny uh, is also likely to contribute to conflict dynamics in the US-China relations in, in many of the same ways that the RBO uh, exceptionalism does. So in sum, uh, while their content uh, is different, uh, these two uh, uh, narratives about order may actually have similar effects, namely to underscore in-group virtuousness and out-group differentness, which as I noted, tends to be related to rail policy practices and uh, conflictual behavior. So I'll stop there, thank you. <clears throat> Great, thanks so much, Ian, and to all the panelists. We have about half an hour for questions. Um, I'm gonna throw out one or two big questions for all the panelists and try to incorporate one or two from the Q&A. If you could then all respond, and then we'll hopefully have time for at least another round of uh, discussion based on the questions that have been popping up. Um, so uh, this is, first of all, let me say it's been tremendously stimulating. Um, I've really learned a lot. Um, and it's clear that many of you, you know, don't use the term order in the singular, that there are multiple orders um, and these don't necessarily uh, break down neatly into economic versus security orders. Even within the economic realm, there may be multiple orders as Yelling's uh, presentation um, suggested. Um, so given that, um, and, and another point that I heard across many of these presentations is uh, that conflict, while very real and present, is not inevitable. Um, and so I'm curious if everyone could briefly elaborate on how they think that less conflictual dynamics could evolve. Some of you have touched on this a little. Danny uh, discussed briefly his notion of meta regimes with Steve Walt. Um, Others have emphasized again that conflict is not inevitable because of you know we, what we know from history, for example, or other um, uh, uh, approaches. Um, but at the same time, Ian just introduced us to social identity theory, which uh, you know can also uh, uh, point to the ratcheting up of conflict as different sides otherize each other. Uh, so I wonder if we could comment on how we might go from the dynamics playing out in these different orders to a less conflictual set of dynamics. Um, and I think that set of questions dovetails nicely with some of the other questions that have appeared in the chat about, you know, for example, whether um, whether there's a precedent um, uh, in, in the US criticizing Chinese uh, expansionist policies in Asia, given the adoption of the Monroe Doctrine in the 19th century, um, what, what can we learn from that historical analogy, if anything? Um, and, and, uh, and, and some in the chat have raised the question about whether uh, there's a problem with establishing an alternative world order, um, uh, given that, uh, as some speakers have suggested, the US-based rules-based order has not necessarily produced prosper prosperity, stability, and um, peace for all. Uh, so uh, why don't we start in the order of the presentations and see if you want to comment on any of any of these questions. Uh, Danny. Uh, I think you're muted. And no matter how many times you use Zoom, it's, you know, you never get used to this. Um, uh, I guess it's better than the other era where you know you're you're talking to to your son and and uh, you know reprimand him while you're you're live on Zoom, but um, the 
Uh, I think you're 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 right, uh, Melanie, that there was this uh, this dual theme of both that that we need to think of of multiple uh, orders um, with very different rules, some much more cooperative uh, um, and and involving sort of deeper set of rules, and others much thinner um, and giving much more room to the national or you know showing much greater deference to national sovereignty. Um, and the second big theme that uh, that that conflict is is not inevitable. I mean, I I, I heard that basically in uh, in in all of the the participants. Um, so I think going back to the to the to the first theme of multiple um, uh, orders. So the the question the, the meta question becomes: How do you you know what kind of a conversation, what kind of a structure of relations between U.S. and China, as well as other actors? Uh, would produce uh, a set of um, a, a set of parallel orders that um, do not create a negative self re reinforcing dynamic. Um, and of course, the kind of dynamic that is probably the most worrisome is where sort of you know the kind of you know a, a search for a maximalist um, uh, um, conception of national security. Translates into a kind of a you know you know a search for military dominance and this kind of geopolitical uh, issue shadows all other orders so that you know like economic interdependence becomes weaponized to the extreme of in the uh, you know um, uh, um, for for national um, uh, foreign policy goals and national uh, security um, uh, objectives and therefore. You know, essentially, you know, whatever it starts out as multiple orders uh, collapses into a kind of one big competition for power um, and, and potentially sort of military conflict. Um, and, and the other con the other dynamic, so that's the dynamic we want to avoid. Um, the, the positive dynamic is where we start with the notion that um, uh, that that there are differences uh, in the internal organization of these societies. Um, that the United States understands um, that the Chinese economy, for example, is not going to become um, like the US economy. So that, for example, in a lot of domains such as trade um, and investment, it gives up the search for deep economic integration sort of or, or holds these supposed WTO rules um, uh, um, on top of, you know, sort of, you know, uh, you know, on the over the head of China, saying that you have to abide by these kinds of rules because this is what a liberal international trade and investment order requires, um, and and is and, and that U.S. is willing to accept that, you know, that the China there is going to be have to be much greater sphere of autonomy and maneuver for China to construct its own economic order that differs. That might well mean a much thinner set of international agreements on trade and investment, um, but that the U.S. starts with that understanding. I think they maybe the security equivalent of that might be that you know China will exercise um, a certain amount of regional power um, in in Asia uh, without necessarily invading other countries or exercising you know military force. Um, so what the exact national security or the geopolitical um, equivalent of that is I would leave to IR scholars. So there's a certain amount of deference on the part of the US to Chinese preferences in terms of the rules with respect to China is running its economic and trade relationships. I think by the same token, I think China would have to understand uh, that, you know, in, in the economics, there are both economic and national security and technological um, considerations for why uh, the U.S. might want to keep up Chinese firms um, outside the U.S. market. The economic argument might be, although that's largely water under the bridge, that too many American communities are hurt very deeply uh, by a very sudden spike of exports from China. Although, as I said, this is probably water under the bridge. So there's a certain amount of protection uh, might have been legitimate. Um, uh, but more broadly in the area of telecoms and various sort of high tech areas that there is a legitimate um, reason for the United States to want to keep some Chinese firms from outs, you know, from uh, investing in the United States. 
Um, and I think that a, 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 a proper relationship would structure this conversation where the United States is able to explain what exactly the national security motive for keeping Chinese firms out of the United States is without externalizing um, uh, this motive um, and internationalizing it. So for, in my book, it would be okay. It's okay for the US to keep Huawei out of the US on the grounds of legitimate worries about uh, 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 technology and espionage, but it's not okay for the United States to try to mobilize an entire global alliance against Huawei and keeping them all, you know, sort of keeping Huawei out of the entire world, uh, when in fact uh, Huawei provides very important services um, to a lot of, you know, uh, countries around the world, and it's for other countries to decide where to this trade off between having access to cheap telecom versus potential national security or technology um, uh, uh, threats, um, you know, how to strike the balance beyond that. So I think, you know, from that sort of set of beginnings might emerge um, a set of relationship that is much more in a positive dynamic, that is this idea of, of well-calibrated responses, uh, that is that let each country take care of its own fundamental interests uh, without turning into a kind of this, you know, security dilemma being working out, which is that defensive measures get misinterpreted uh, as offensive measures. And that's, I think, is possible, but it's only possible through a kind of a, a mutual accounting and reason giving uh, of why countries are doing what they're giving, what they're doing. Great, thanks. Uh, Yelling, did you want to add something here? Sure. <clears throat> um... Melanie, I, I mean, I think you're basically asking the question, right, um, on how to how to shift towards uh, a different dynamic. And here, I think, you know, in, in a sense, I'm going to echo a lot of what the other panelists have, have said. Um, one of the one of my current research projects uh, looks at a very large corpus of uh, Chinese media articles related to science and technology. Um, over a span of over 15 years, from so from 2005 to 2021, all of the different media articles related to science and technology um, published by different Chinese newspapers. And what we're seeing is um, how, we're, what we're looking at is how this discourse around science and technology actually responds and shifts in reaction to various external events and uh, um, moments of external coercion. And one of the more recent shifts that we're seeing is in response to um, the various technology export controls imposed by the Trump administration from 2018 onwards and studying in depth the Chinese reaction, right? In, in these media articles focused on science and technology, what we're seeing is a real shift in discourse towards notions away from uh, cooperation. So away from viewing innovation as something that is mutually beneficial, uh, that, that innovation can be achieved and advanced through cooperation internationally, a shift towards the securitization and um, a shift towards self-reliance in the innovation sphere. And what we're seeing is basically a, a, a social updating on the part of uh, the Chinese um, policy system over how they understand the nature of science and technology and the role that cooperation place um, in terms of advancing uh, the Chinese economy or strengthening the Chinese nation. And so this relates, I think, quite strongly to what Ian was talking about in, in the sense that we, we need to look at social psychology literature to understand how, um, how differences emerge and become entrenched in terms of the mutual perceptions of two different parties. And what we're finding in this research and looking at the, the newspaper articles is that it's very difficult to unravel a shift away from open cooperation towards closed innovation once it happens because the updating that's happening um, on, on the side of each party is not purely rational. It's not purely a, a measurement of costs and benefits. If it was purely that, 
what we could do, right, as a policy response is, is to try and shift the balance of costs and benefits. The problem is that the updating is also social and so it's about perceptions. And so then the question is, how do we shift those perceptions away from this sort of mutual disengagement and a securitization towards one of cooperation? Um, one way I think would be to look for ways to reset the understanding of the relationship, right? So some, some of what Danny has suge suggested, I think um, might be quite useful, right? To, to go back to the most basic principles um, that both sides can agree on, if it might entail or require a thinner version of um, uh, globalization, it might nevertheless be worth it, right? If it shifts both parties towards a, a different dynamic, one of mutually reinforcing cooperation rather than splintering and spiraling into um, a lack of cooperation. I think the ways in which countries apply their policies really matter in how these policies are perceived. When these policies are implemented and in the form of targeting, right? that generates in-group, out-group dynamics that are not helpful. When policies are implemented in the, and, and framed as a way of we're implementing existing policies on an even-handed basis, right? So any company that violates the United States rules will be punished according to United States laws. That's very different from a framing of targeting. So I think that needs to shift as well. Great, um, Stacy. And no, thank you for these these um, wonderful questions. And I think I'm just going to amplify a lot of what my, my colleagues have said here. You know, obviously, I think all of us are working with the idea that there are multiple orders um, to, to, to go to Ian's point. What I think is important is even though there might be a reality of multiple orders, certainly at least since the 1990s, the United States has really developed a strong narrative of a singular global order. And I think that's important not only for the ways in which the United States has understood attempts to kind of build a diversity of orders and governance systems, um, you know, but but also for the ways in which the United States has kind of enacted a, a, its own order, right? So whether or not we're thinking about the WTO and the deepening and expansion of that order in the 1990s, um, similarly uh, about for example, the deepening expansion of things like the proliferation order, right? There's a kind of this movement towards almost a very rigid order that kind of denies a certain amount of pluralism of, of, of interests and positions. Um, and this actually brings me to the point about the question of conflict. I, it, obviously, I, I don't think conflict is inevitable, but to kind of speak from the US side in particular, I think a lot of this hinges on the United States ability to begin to recognize that it can both, to be clear, hold on to liberal principles and accept a plurality of, of orders. And, and actually, Melanie, I, I can't help because you actually brought up the Monroe Doctrine. Actually, I say this is actually, to my mind, a great example, right? Because the Monroe Doctrine isn't just something that the United States kind of unilaterally went, you know, boom, here, here, here it is, and this is the way this is going to be ordered. That this actually comes as a result of really ongoing painful negotiations between the United States and Britain over the extent to which the UK was going to support a European imperial order, um, and, and particularly in South America during the uh, during the rebellion of the South American co uh, Spanish colonies. So that actually goes to the point: this question of is there going to be kind of a plurality of orders, and what are the various states that are thinking about this and establishing orders? How are they going to negotiate to reduce the friction at the boundaries of those orders as opposed to creating these very closed orders where you get these kind of dynamics that both Yaelin and, and, and Ian are talking about of really othering in competition. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn it over to Jia Daozhang if you have anything you want to add and Ian, and then I've got another round of quick questions to wrap things up. All right. Um why conflict is not inevitable the cost is known because we are both nuclear armed states but more importantly chinese no matter how you translate no matter how you summarize as i observe it we don't reject the notion of hegemonic stability if it's not the us being the hegemon somebody else has to be the hegemon and hegemons very much like the patriarch of a large family. Um, it, its role is controversial, it's not satisfied itself, and uh, there are arguments. And also, 
if you observe the nuance of uh, Chinese policy or policy debates, uh, we do. I, I think that that it's not just here in China, in the on the U.S. side of that of any country, you make a difference between style and substance. A lot of times, uh, the reaction, especially that gets into the media or, you know, is the reaction to style, but not necessarily the substance. Speaking of which, I would think um, one of these, if that does not lead to conflict, it's just something that came to my mind. Uh, in addition to what I said about, we don't understand here why, you know, you want Japan to be part of your wealth creation as part of the trade where well, now this time you reject. We, another thing we don't quite understand is why the US started to take on the pharmaceutical supply chains because China did not do anything to temper with that. Also because the biotechnology, yes, it can have military applications, but first and foremost is medical, you know, for medical use. I don't know why the U.S. seems to be taking on Chinese biotech biotech companies. Huawei, yeah, that's understandable. All right, you know, it's a prestige. It makes money. You know, Huawei made use of your talents. But with my goodness, biotech. So those are the kind of thing that may eventually create some gathering mess and say, what what, what is the U.S. You know, it's, I, again, bear in mind what I said about the separation between st style, rhetoric, and substance, and what you, you do observe, regardless of how the other party does or what it says about you. No, the conflict is not inevitable. Great. And I'm going to turn to Ian. I, I will call your attention, uh, Ian, to a couple of questions that seem directed at you in the chat. One is, um, how, uh, you know, building on social identity theory, um, how would you build alternative narratives if international order is an emergent property and if and, and who should be the target of these narratives? So that's one question. Maybe you want to throw in a, th a few thoughts there. The other thing is there's a, a, a point about shared challenges and the need to think, you know, way beyond the short term, which informs much foreign policy. So uh, when we think about social identity theory, one of the sort of ways out of this spiral of othering is uh, the adoption of a superordinate goal. So uh, perhaps, you know, pandemic, climate change, you know, can these play a role in, in sort of unraveling the spiral a little? Yeah, so five minutes remaining and I've been asked to, <laughs> Uh, suggest how to avoid a conflict, further conflictual relation to the U.S.-China uh, relationship. So, um, I, as an academic, I try to avoid policy recommendations because, um, and you know, there's a good reason. For the most part, academics actually have no clue as to how policy is actually made, or the constraints under which policymakers act. So, um, I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to even try to suggest anything concrete or or realistic. Um, in principle. Um, you know, we have to learn how to embrace analytic complexity uh, and use the language of analytic complexity uh, and be willing to um, uh, summarize and um, synopsize and express complexity uh, in language that, um, that reduces the tendency to uh, simplify along these lines that I was talking about in terms of, of um, identity difference. Um, it's possible that if we learn or if we use uh, uh, to, or we embrace the language of complexity uh, and multiple, the ideas of multiple orders and multiple interests, et cetera, that this may reveal areas of, uh, more areas of cooperation than at the moment, uh, that at least uh, seem to be obscured. Um, uh, but complexity is also going to, uh, you know, compel would compel both sides to uh, acknowledge where uh, there are clear conflicts of interest, uh, and also, um, uh, you know, where there are uh, conflicts of interest that are being exaggerated when framed as uh, um, uh, conflicts of identity. Um, 
I'm actually, uh, social identity theory does not lead you to being optimistic uh, at all, uh, I think. And, um, you know, in-group cohesion rests on uh, exceptionalist uh, discourses. And um, uh, as both sides gear up for a great power competition, this requires enhancing in-group uh, cohesiveness uh, and therefore a, a stronger interest in emphasizing um, exceptionalist language. Um, on the PRC, there's an additional uh, set of concerns that in addition to the great power competition, namely Xi Jinping's uh, longstanding concern about avoiding the, 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 avoiding the history that, that the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union faced. In other words, the collapse of, of Communist Party rule in China. That, the lessons he's learned from the collapse of the CPSU, um, I think also require uh, greater stress on in-group uh, differentness. Um, and, uh, um, and so you've got lots of reasons why both sides have an interest in emphasizing um, uh, identity uh, uh, differentness, uh, identity exceptionalism. Um, just a quick, a quick response to uh, to uh, something that uh, that uh, Stacy mentioned. Uh, I actually liked the argument about kind of your your argument about the United States um, inviting potentially revisionist states into institutions. Uh, actually helped explain to me why you get such a messy mix distribution of of, of norms and institutions that rising powers like China embrace along with the dominant states like the United States. And, and, and in a sense, that messiness may in fact be an effect of uh, the strategy that you were uh, talking about in the, in the 1990s. Although I guess I would attribute a little bit less agency to the United States and all of that, because a lot of the institutions uh, the Chinese have signed on to um, that constitute the so-called rules-based order um, uh, were developed or pushed by Europeans. Um, you know, or by the global south. Uh, and so in a sense, what we observe in terms of the orders uh, out there at the moment, how they operate, um, are less of a function of American agency, it seems to me, um, than the American discourse uh, suggests. But anyway, um, so I'll stop there. Great. And I know we're almost out of time, but we do have a number of questions uh, about asking the panelists to comment on the Ukraine crisis, the uh, US-China-Russia relations, uh, shifts from the Trump to the Biden administration, and the potential effects on US-Chinese relations. So I would invite anyone who wants to jump in and comment on these issues very briefly. Uh, uh, to please do so, or if you want to make any other final remarks before we close it out. Um, so please feel free to let me know if you'd like to jump in. I don't know if Danny, you want to comment on, on these issues or anything else. Okay, um, so the not going to be a, 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 a policy analyst here. Um, anyone else want to jump in? I, I know, um, Stacy, you had mentioned you'd be happy to talk about Russia um, and, and related issues, but maybe that's not commenting on the current dynamics. Um, I, I'll be really briefly brief here. Um, you know, I, I think that two things here and two questions that seem to be coming up. I mean, first of all, the question of uh, China and Russia and, you know, the, the extent of partnership. Um, and obviously there was the Xi Putin statement and things like that. My sense, and I'd be really eager to hear this um, from my colleagues who are actually China specialists, is that was, you know, more rhetoric and less action and that China continues to be extremely reluctant to, to, to look like a partner in, 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 in territorial aggression. Uh, to, to my mind, um, what is it, what has really interested me about Russia and especially in, in the last few statements that have come out with Putin um, is the kind of appeals to a differential order and much more embracing the rhetoric of, of, of challenging an order. And here again, I actually think there's a huge uh, disparity between the language of challenging the order in the Russia's case and in the resources that they have. Um, and I tend to be in, in, in the camp that says a lot of time, these limited uses of force, and again, not to say that that Russia is weak, but actually shows kind of a, a, an attempt to kind of control a small amount of the global order rather than try to necessarily change it itself. In Sorry. the everyday language of uh, diplomacy uh, discussion, I'm sort of being a media person, China loses. <laughs> 
either by geographical affinity, I mean, association with Russia or what just happened when the Mr. Putin came to Beijing for the Olympics. Yes, if you imagine, you know, back in 2008 when President, former President Bush was also at the Olympics. Uh, there is a serious point here. I would think the, uh, uh, to, I'm not saying that here in China, you don't have elements of uh, the, that strand of thinking in terms of, you know, working with Russia towards an eventual alternative order. But to balance that off, there has to be some uh, access to the US, um, even let's say in energy. Should we be uh, act, buying more energy from the US? Why would we have to buy from Russia? We buy anyways, right? Uh, make that structural. And uh, if we had some sort of improvement uh, in discussions, even, you know, it recently wasn't uh, but there was this big announcement that the Biden team has no intention of engaging China in coming up with an Indo-Pacific uh, whatever economic framework. It sounds like the good old strategy of containment. No, but I'm not complaining. I'm basically saying there has to be some balancing off uh, that that would uh, some uh, that would probably help out. Um, Yelling or Ian, did you want to make some final remarks? Yeah, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Great. Oh, oh. okay. Ian, the floor oh, is okay. yours. Yeah. So, um, actually, I just wanted to take a stab at the uh, question about Trump to Biden transition. I'm not entirely sure what the question was, but <clears throat> what's interesting about the the uh, the discourse about order under Trump was that there was a little less frequent use, actually a lot less frequent use of the term rules-based order in the Trump administration than under the Biden administration. So the Biden administration, I mean, you know, every second statement coming out of Lincoln is something about the rules-based order. Um, so it's used much more frequently by the Biden administration. The Trump administration used the term revisionist more frequently than the uh, Biden administration has. I think in the, the net effect is probably similar. In other words, whether you focus on the term rules-based order or you focus on the term China as a revisionist, it still is creating this binary of, of, uh, of uh, an exceptionalism uh, on the one, of, of US exceptionalism versus a Chinese exceptionalism. <clears throat> I think the risk though is that post 2024, if we look at the list of potential Republican candidates, uh, if, if the, the Trump wing captures the presidency. I think there's a risk of the exceptionalism discourse heading off in very dark directions. Um, given the racial resentment that the Trump wing uh, feeds off of, um, you know, Pompeo most recently said something along the lines that uh, the United States should seek to, in a sense, to hive off the Russian people from the Russian regime in order to gear up to deal with China. The implication being that you could hive off the Russian people. And why? Because he said they have a European outlook, which strikes me as a kind of a code word for a European slash Anglo-American slash white uh, Christian outlook. Um, the same language used by this German uh, Navy chief uh, who just resigned for, for basically saying, you know, we should be um, luring the, the Russians onto our side to deal with China because the Russians are a Christian nation. I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of discourse uh, towards China after 2024. Um, and that not, of course, only puts Chinese Americans in a difficult position, but it's also more likely to feed into um, a, uh, an ethno-nationalist discourse in China, where Xi Jinping, for example, well, actually not just Xi Jinping, but the Communist Party in general, blurs the distinction, consistently blurs the distinction between ethnicity and nationality, implying that ethnic Chinese around the world have a responsibility to uh, uh, contribute to China's uh, rejuvenation, right? Um, regardless of nationality, which puts ethnic Chinese Americans, Australian Americans, Canadian, uh, sorry, Australian Chinese or Canadian Chinese, extraordinarily difficult position. Um, and one can imagine post 2024, a much more kind of malevolent focus in the United States on the ethnic Chinese community, um, 
precisely because ethno-nationalists in China are making that connection and precisely because uh, the Xi regime for legitimization purposes, et cetera, is gonna play up uh, ethno-national uh, distinctiveness. So, um, and again, that comes from social identity theory and it's the reason I'm pessimistic. Well, on that Can note, just... oh yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Like... so sorry, I was uh, triggered by Ian's comments to, to uh, share something. So, you know, as someone who is neither from the United States nor from China, I think that Ian's um, comments right uh, right at the end there were, were spot on. And something I didn't mention earlier when talking about these different, you know, competing coalitions is how countries outside of this US-China binary um, feel or perceive this ongoing division um, between the, the two great powers. And, you know, many of, of the countries that say the United States might be trying to pull into its coalition have no interest in being in one coalition versus another, right? So the danger of this discourse and where it might be headed in the future is that it puts um, a lot of people from third nations in a very, very difficult position of being asked to choose in a very simplified, you know, almost tribal dichotomy of are you in this camp or are you in, in, in a different camp? And, and that ignores the, the, you know, interests of these countries. They have their own foreign policy. They have their own um, uh, ways of, of viewing, viewing the world and uh, really downplays, you know, kind of the diversity of, of um, uh, interest in the rest of the world, right? And it's all being overshadowed by this very, very simplified discourse that's emerging of, you know, are you on this side or are you on the other side? Great, well, thank you, Yelling. Thanks to all the panelists. I learned a tremendous amount from the panel. I'm uh, really grateful for all of you joining us and sharing your wisdom from near and very far. <laughs> and uh, thank you again.